Welcome everyone. Thank you very much for tuning in to our discussion today with Dr. Phil. We are here tonight um, with Dr. Phil Ritchie, who is a clinical and consultant consulting psychologist, and Sarah McEwen, who is a civilian member of OPS and an accredited life coach, as well as a spouse of a first responder and my partner in crime in developing all the programs here for the spouses here at the Ottawa First Responders Foundation. Welcome to you both. Um, Sarah, would you like to take it from here? Sure, yes. Thank you um, for joining us, Dr. Phil. And I, I'm, I wanna start off by just knowing a little bit about your background um, and your experience with working with first responders. I know that that's something you often are doing. So how did you get to that? Well, at the start of my career, going back 30 years, uh, I had an opportunity to volunteer with a critical incident stress debriefing team. Um, and, you know, full confession, I'm a complete wannabe. I, I, uh, I have so much respect for what folks, um, uh, uh, what first responders do and what they offer uh, our community. Um, and then I heard about this, this chance to, uh, um, on the one hand, support them, and on the other hand, get ride-alongs. Uh, and, uh, and so being kind of a big kid, um, uh, my eyes just lit up and it was, you know, where do I sign up? And so 30 years ago, I started volunteering as a, as a, uh, a mental health professional with, um, with a debriefing team here uh, in Ottawa, but also throughout the Ottawa Valley. Mm. And it's one of those situations where you just, uh, I don't have, um, how do I say it? Uh, I don't have an altruistic bone in my body. When I volunteer or do something nice for someone, it's because it feels good, right? You enjoy doing it. I got to rub shoulders with some of the most interesting giving people this city has uh, in, in, you know, in the form of first responders and their family members. And so I was really excited about that. But from that, all of a sudden, these other opportunities came up. I was working at a school board um, and I, I'm licensed to work with both kids and, and adults. And, uh, um, and so I was working at a school board. I was heading up their tragic events response team. I was seconded by Health Canada to go to Nova Scotia uh, after the crash of Swiss Air. Um, I've been seconded on different occasions by the city or the regional municipality um, with the OC Transpo shootings, with the bus train collision, and then the most recent bus collision. Um, I went to Sri Lanka after the tsunami with an American NGO, uh, and, and I've had a chance to serve. Uh, there's a primarily American group, the Society for Police and Criminal Psychology. I've been on their executive, and I'm a, a, a past uh, co-president there as well. So all these different things, you know, you start out going, yo, I get to ride along, uh, and all of a sudden, these, these other opportunities presented themselves. I went from the school board to working at CHEO uh, and, uh, um, and over the course of several years there, I did a lot of work uh, debriefing their staff as well and being an employee support. And I'm still on staff with them uh, on an occasional basis, and, but it's all around employee wellness. I don't work with kids anymore. Um, mm -hmm. And in my private practice, I work with uh, about 80% of the people I see are first responders and about 20% are healthcare professionals. Um, wow. And so, yeah, so that's uh, how I got into it. That's nice. So it sounds like it uh, was almost a natural progression slowly and, and you found your way in there. That's uh, really interesting. Um, you know, I, you know, you hear a lot about resiliency and it's kind of become the buzzword. And actually, sometimes, you know, you're hearing it too much and sort of goes over one's head. But I am curious to know, um, you know, we, we know it's, it's, the ability to recover from difficulties and what would you consider the most common attributes among those that are resilient? Um, and is it something that we can learn, all learn? Yeah, so, so a couple of things. One is that resilience is really that ability to bounce back. And I think that there are some people who are just, uh, you know, sometimes in spite of life circumstances, they, they've experienced all kinds of adversity and yet they keep bouncing back and they don't seem to uh, you know, go through life bitter or resentful or anything else. And they, but, there, but there are things that we can do to encourage resilience. And so one of the things, and I tell parents this when I talk with them, you know, that with our kids, we do well with moderate predictable levels of stress, right? Mm -hmm. And so that, that our resilience, and, and there's actually a, a parallel with our immune system. We know that kids who grow up on farms have stronger immune systems than kids in the city because kids in the city are too clean um, and kids in the, in the, in, on farms literally grow up playing in poop. And, and that challenge <laughs> to their immune system actually improves, uh, improves it, right? Mm -hmm. And one of the things about coming out of a, a pandemic 
um, is one of the things they've said is when we get through the whole COVID stuff, our immune systems, we, through you know, good hand wash, good hand hygiene, and and face masks, social distancing, all that stuff, we actually haven't challenged our immune systems a whole lot. And there'll be lots of colds and flus and whatever, um, but hopefully they'll just be the garden variety and none of the uh, coronavirus kind. So, so you know, those challenges help us. The same thing happens with resilience. That when we challenge ourselves, not in an extreme way, not I'm not talking about trauma and abuse, but I'm talking about the regular life challenges that happen. That in fact that encourages the development of of resilience, mm. and uh, you know, and I think that first responders are among the most naturally resilient people um, I've ever met. And and the way I describe it is, you know, I think they would all go to work the first week. Um, and because like me, lots of them are just big kids and, and yep, the whole idea of, yeah, ride alongs and, you know, sirens and lights and all this other stuff is pretty exciting. And the work they do is really interesting, meaningful, exciting, everything else. But after about that first week, if you keep going back to work, there's a degree of resilience because mm -hmm. uh, the challenges faced by our first responders um, are such that, that if you didn't have that resilience, I think you would just walk away. And that's, of course, made worse by, uh, you know, the fact that uh, it, it, no matter what you do, it doesn't seem like you can pull up to, to any kind of scene without, you know, about seven people whipping out their cell phones and recording your every interaction, mm -hmm. um, no matter what it is, right? And that just compounds the stress. So I think generally people bring the resilience with them. But when I meet with uh, first responders who may have some kind of occupational stress injury, including post-traumatic stress disorder, um, mm -hmm. I point out to them that it's not that, oh, you were resilient before, but now you're not. They're still resilient. It's just mm -hmm. that their resilience has been overwhelmed um, because the, the, the trauma of the work that they do is cumulative, right? right? The really cool part, and in some ways the surprising part is most first responders don't develop PTSD. Hmm. All first responders um, you know, can check the box that says they've been traumatized. Every single mm -hmm. first responder spending mm -hmm. any time on the road uh, can check that box. But the, the really cool part is they're affected by it. For sure, they're affected by it. But most don't develop PTSD. Mm -hmm. and, and, and following up that, though, so do you find like that the people that are joining as a first responder, do they have that ability then maybe to um, see find the gratitude or like I'm just curious to see like what what do you think it is that uh, their ability to be that resilient well and, and again I, I I suspect each of us can think of people in our lives that have just had in, in some ways very challenging times but 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 seem to like I said earlier just carry on without without holding any kind of grudge and and I think that there are those people who who bring it with them but I think that you can also uh, when you're surrounded by resilient people it encourages your own resilience right mm -hmm. and so if I look to my side and I see you know I've got my colleague here who's going through a similar call to me and I see you know what they seem to be able to um, to bounce back okay it's kind of encouraging Right. Mm -hmm. If uh, I, I my favorite, uh, you, you know, believe it or not, this isn't my favorite job. My favorite job uh, I ever had was, was was as a tuba player doing the changing of the guard. Um, <laughs> and it's the only job I've ever had where on my days off, I'd go watch other people do my job. Mm -hmm. But if but, but in doing the changing of the guard, if one of the people went, if one of the soldiers went down, right, passed out because it was a hot day or whatever, there was a much greater chance that others would go down because they see it like, oh, what, what, you know, he or she went down and, and then they start to go as well, right? Mm. The opposite happens that when we're surrounded by strong people who keep managing, who keep coping, um, it's kind of like, hey, you know what? I, I think I can get through this as well. And mm -hmm. so that peer support, and you know, as the mental health professional, I have to acknowledge the importance of peer support uh, and, and family supports mm -hmm. um, in, uh, in, in keeping people resilient, keeping people healthy, right? Right. I, I was talking before about debriefings. Well, we know that for most calls, the best debriefings are the car to car debriefings, you know, and, and just mm -hmm. if you're talking about cops, if, if you're a firefighter, or paramedic, then it can be with your partner as a paramedic or a firefighter with your team back at the station, right? But those peer uh, kind of debriefings can be really, really helpful. Right. So, yeah. see, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, so it sounds like there's a couple things here. It's like you are, if you're a first responder and you go back and back, you are a resilient person, but there's all these other compounding things as well. Having a good support system, community, your patrol, 
um, that kind of stuff. And it could probably go the other way as well. If you don't have that, then it, it's, you're falling more into that zone of not being resilient. Is that Absolutely. what you're saying? Yeah. yeah. And, you know, you talk about buzzwords and one of the buzzwords is balance as well. Right. And we always talk about balance, but we also have to be a little bit careful with balance. One of the things we've realized is particularly so. So um, in my work at Chio, uh, um, I, I was on a training committee there and we would interview prospective residents and we'd ask them about how do you find balance in your life? And then I realized that you, well, I didn't realize <laughs> I was talking with someone about this um, and, and she said, she said, you know, we have to watch that balance question because it's an unfair question sometimes for women, particularly for moms, uh, because, um, you, you know, even in 2021, uh, lots and lots of times the, the lion's share of the, the um, child care and the mm -hmm. um, uh, um, cooking, things like that, cleaning still can sometimes fall more on their shoulders. And so you go, okay. And, and, you know, you have some psychologists out there saying, oh, and it's good if your kids aren't spending too much time on technology <laughs> and, and boy, isn't it nice to all sit down as a family together and need a meal um, and all these other things. Right. And, and so, add it, adding COVID. Add oh. COVID to the mix. And if you're, if you happen <laughs> to be the partner of a first responder, you know, sitting down for a meal all together can be a bit of a challenge. Lots 100%. of the time. Yeah, yeah. Well, this, is, you know? this is really but, great because actually this, my follow-up question to this then is resiliency in the family. So I'm curious to know like the, the family, um, so as a spouse myself, I'm listening to this and I can completely resonate. And would you, what would you say like, so we all know the first responder is resilient typically yeah. if they're doing this job um, and they have the ability, even if they're, they have OSIs to bounce back. And do you find mm -hmm. like, what about the family, um, the spouse, like, the resiliency of that. Is there anything that you have sort of learned in that regard? Um, I think that uh, first of all, um, and uh, you know, uh, first responders um, want to protect people in their community, right? And they, they are, um, uh, they're givers, right? Mm -hmm. And they don't want to protect anyone more than they want to protect their own family. Um, but having said that, sometimes they really suck at it because what they do is they come home and they go, how, and someone says to them, how was your day? And by the way, women can be just as bad at this as men can. How was your day? Oh, it's fine, right? And, and you know, you're not fooling anybody. They see you've had a really tough day, but you don't want them to worry, right? Mm -hmm. And, and, and the, the analogy I give someone is if you have your, your daughter come home from a first date, and she comes in a little bit after and she just looks really upset and disheveled and everything else. And you say to her, how are you doing? You know, you can see, and, and, and her answer is, oh, no, I'm good. And just goes off to bed. Like, does your anxiety level go down or does it go up? It's like, <laughs> the hell happened here? You know, right. like just, well, I don't think that the, that, that, that the, the, the first responders are any more reassuring when they say to, to a significant other, oh, no, I'm good, you know, when they're not, yeah. right? Right. I do it encourage, <laughs> what's that? I said, it makes it worse when they just say, oh, a hundred percent. That's yeah. right. Um, uh, uh, it, it, it's sort of that opposite effect, right? You know, it, it, it's a bit like telling someone to calm down. It's usually the surest, fastest way to have the opposite effect, right? <laughs> right. Um, but anyway, getting back to, back to the first responders, um, when I do debriefings, one of the things that, that, you know, debriefings, it's all about, first of all, acknowledging what's happened. Secondly, acknowledging that this affects people. Not everybody is traumatized by it. Um, and uh, one of the people I work with, with Ottawa Police, uh, who will sometimes do debriefings with me, Steve Bond has a great expression, which is, it's okay to be okay, and it's okay to not be okay. And those right. two things are both really true, you know? Mm -hmm. And so you give people that kind of permission, but it's also all about controlling the things you can control. So much of the time we spend worrying about things that are beyond our control. And it's like, no, find those things you can control, mm -hmm. right? But one of the things I tell people to control is having a script for when you go home that you can mm. tell your loved ones when they say, how was your day? Mm. And it's okay to say, it was a really bad call today. I really had a, a difficult situation. I'm okay. Um, I can't give you all the details or I won't give you all the details, but I will talk about it when I'm, when I'm ready. And that'll mm. happen in the next, you know, and, and I don't like to leave things open because otherwise it's like, well, I'll talk about, no, I'm not ready. I'm not ready. You know, you can spend 27 years not being ready. It's like, yes. yeah, I'll find a time to talk to you about it in the next day or two. Max, Wonderful. you know, and so you sort of make it, make it a bit of a, a, a limit time limited 
uh, situation, but but and and they shouldn't have to tell you all the details. You don't want to hear all the details, and sometimes they're not allowed to share all the details. But they do need to tell you it's been a tough call. Uh, these are the things I'm doing to take care of myself. Is Wonderful. also really helpful, you know. And 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 the other thing is, you know, um, uh, when when when. <laughs> Um, it's not a good idea to start looking for the fire exits as the building's burning down, you know, and that's a first responder analogy. Um, mm -hmm. You, you want to be prepared ahead of time. And so have these ideas beforehand. When you've had your worst day, what are your go-to strategies? Is it going to be, yep, uh, I'm going to talk to, you know, my good friend so-and-so. Um, is it going to be that I need to go for a run or get some exercise? Or is it going to be that I'm just going to drink my face off and, and, and mm -hmm. smoke twice as much weed as I might otherwise smoke? You know, because some of those are helpful and some of those things are not helpful, right? And so mm -hmm. having those plans beforehand, I know when I would ever come back from, from any uh, kind of uh, disaster response, my wife would, 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 she was very good, first of all, about letting me uh, go to these things because we had you know at the time a young family um and but when i would come back she'd say you know i think you need to go for lunch with peter and peter is is a social worker friend of mine colleague we actually share an office in private practice and he's a former cop um but uh, oh. um yeah, it covers all the bases um, <laughs> and we would go for lunch and you know and, and and talk about stuff and and it was just my way of kind of coming down um, mm. and, and the other thing is, and, and I think we're doing a better job of this now, is destigmatizing mental illness, right? Mm. So you go, mental illness, I, and, and what we do, we talk about mental health, like, like it's a problem. I think they have a problem with mental health. That, no, they have a problem with mental illness, and, and, and we kind of dance around that whole thing, depression, mm. anxiety, all those things. In Ontario, the statistics are one in five will meet criteria for a diagnosable mental illness. Wow. Right? You don't have to be a math whiz to kind of go, okay, even if I'm an only child, I've got two parents and four, grand grand four grandparents, that's seven of us. And if it's all, one in five, odds are already someone in my family has a mental illness, you know, but yeah. it's not, it's not the end of the world unless we decide that we're not going to talk about it and that we're going to just get all twitchy about it. I know yeah. because I work primarily with, with police, I know that both Ottawa police and Ontario police when you have a new recruit class graduating, they're giving them the same message. Don't wait until they're a problem. Find someone to check in with now. Proactive, you know, kind of yeah. Proactive approach, exactly. Right. You know, yeah. so, so yeah, so not waiting, uh, having strategies in place beforehand, um, those kinds of things. I was gonna say that sounds, I, I love that, that idea of already having the conversation with your spouse before, um, it gets to that place because then you're in that place and you don't know what to say. Right. And right. I also, as a spouse, I like to hear that, you know, giving them that space is, I mean, I, I know it's okay, but then you're like, well, how long is okay. So having that timeline, like you said, also really important because it gives that kind of like, there isn't going to be this 26 years of all these PTSD <laughs> possibilities and your stress. Yeah. So, yeah. So the communication piece, um, you know, having, that script, you know, mm -hmm. is really interesting to me. I love that idea. And even on the side of the spouse, having the same idea as a script saying, and proactively saying, you know, when you go through something, I will approach you this way. And yep. you tell me when you're ready or timeline. Um, yep. Really helpful on our end as well. Yeah. Yeah. What do you think, Amber? I, I agree. I mean, we've had this conversation in our monthly meetings, um, this topic specifically about the communication and talking and creating a script and trying to determine what we do when they come in the door. How do we approach them? Because with people with young kids, they the kids just attack and like they want their parent, you know? And we're all, as the spouse being like, okay, here you go. <laughs> but it's hard for us to, to do that because we know that they have to come down from that, that adrenaline rush of, of the actual shift. Right. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I think that that's a whole conversation that we could, we could, we could go on and on. You know, there's, there's, uh, um, but, but what you're talking about that proactive strategy, I, I tell people, you know, in terms of the, the basics of coping routine, ritual, and ridiculous. And the routine <laughs> part is the grind. It's the kind of, and you know, if you have someone who works shift work, or you work shift work yourself, you know you have your routine. It's like 
I'm not going to have a coffee after this time, but I'm going to have an afternoon nap. And then I'll have a coffee when I wake up. And whatever your routine is, you know, you got it. No, I haven't been looking in your windows. I promise. Um, <laughs> well, there but, is no routine. That's the problem. Uh, it, 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 it constantly is changing, right? Right. But, yeah. But you have that. And one of the things that routine gives us is a little tinge of predictability in an otherwise unpredictable world. Mm -hmm. It helps us feel connected a little bit, too. Mm. And ritual is a little bit like that too, except it's more meaningful. And you can have religious rituals, but you can have a Friday night movie and a pizza if you happen to be working days. You know, that could be mm. a ritual for some families. Um, mm. For me, I like to do crossword puzzles in the morning. I'm so, I'm so old, I get an actual newspaper um, <laughs> and, and I do crossword puzzles. And I remember there was one, one day in the summertime where they do, you know, things happen and, and they neglected to put the crossword puzzles in that day. <laughs> and it's when it dawned on me that my routine had gone to a ritual because I was going, ah, my crossword puzzles, how am I going to get going with my dad? It's like, you know, <laughs> there's a certain meaning attached to those now. It's a very calming activity for me, something I really enjoy. It's soothing, whatever. Right. And so that had become the ritual. But the ritual is a bit like the routine. It connects us with others. It gives us some predictability in an otherwise unpredictable world. And then mm -hmm. the ridiculous. And that's the ability to laugh. And Love this it. is where, and, and you know, and I have to tell you, one of the greatest gifts of getting to work with first responders is their sense of humor. <laughs> and uh, and yes. it is strange. It is weird. If anybody <laughs> who didn't work with first responders heard them, they, they, they would think they are just sick and twisted individuals, you know? Um, uh, and it's so essential, you know? And, and the laughter, so we know about adrenaline. Cortisol is long-term stress. It, it, it's one of those hormones as well, but it's more uh, chronic long-term stress. And, and laughter helps us get, uh, get rid of the cortisol, you know? And so, so it's like, so that ridiculous piece, uh, mm -hmm. it's also just as important. Right? Yeah, so the routine I, ritual and ridiculous. I love that. And I love yeah. that it goes really nicely together. I always say play. So for me, it's like, I was yes. like, find time for play. And it could be doing like silly things, like you said, a cartwheel and being funny or dancing in the kitchen. Um, just to bring that light in your life is really important, 100%. especially with all the stress that yeah. you have going on. It's, it's important to remember. Yeah. Um, to bring that in. But I, yeah, I think that's really, really interesting. The um, other thing is I have to say, I've drunk the mindfulness Kool-Aid, right? Like, like, so mindfulness is really, really powerful. And one of the things I have a couple of free apps out there. I don't, I mean, I have, I tell, I recommend a couple of free apps out there. One's called mindfulness coach and one is called PTSD coach. And I recommend PTSD coach, even to my non first responders who don't have PTSD. Um, I recommend it because it's just so useful. And they're both put out by the veterans administration in the States. And, and so, and, and first responders often like that because there's, there is that kind of military uh, feel to a lot of the work that mm -hmm. they do, a lot of the structure to their work environments and things like that. And it gives it a little credibility. Um, but mindfulness has been demonstrated in research time and time again to be really effective, whether it's anxiety, depression, PTSD, whatever it is, it's helpful. And there's three things about mindfulness to know. One is it's about being fully present in the moment. Mm -hmm. Why is that helpful? Well, because the hamster on the wheel, when we're worrying about something, the hamster on the wheel isn't about the present moment. It's about the how comes and the what ifs. And the yeah. how comes are about what happened yesterday, last week, and last year. And the what ifs are about tomorrow, next week, and next year. And two of the three mm -hmm. things I suck at the worst professionally are trying to change the past or predict the future, right? Mm -hmm. And so I have to, but that's what I'm stressing about. So I, I need to let that go by just focusing here on the moment. When we have first responders who are trained in their very um, yeah, you know, they get different driver training than, than, than I ever got, um, but they learn about emer driving under emergency circumstances and so on. If you could go, go into a skit, they'll tr teach you, you know, don't stare at the tree that you want to avoid because you end up driving where you're looking. Look where you want to go. And mindfulness is like that for our mind, right? If I'm sitting at home ruminating about a bad call today, the way I usually cope is go, I don't want to think about that call. Well, as soon as I say that, I'm thinking about it, right? Mindfulness is like looking at the road and not the tree. It's like, I'm going to direct my mind to this present moment. Mm -hmm. Second part about mindfulness is suspending judgment, specifically how we judge ourselves. Mm -hmm. Because first responders, like most of us, are their harshest critics, mm -hmm. right? They're tougher on themselves than they would be on anyone else. But it's at such an extreme level. You know, if, if I had a, a child in grade one, and the teacher says, you know, Phil, spell a cat. Very proudly, I say K-A-T. And the teacher looks at me and goes, 
Phil, you're a friggin' idiot. Like you're never going to amount to anything. You're a loser. I don't think you're going to pass grade one. What were you thinking? There's no can cat. Well, that's absurd. The worst teacher in the world wouldn't say that, right? Mm -hmm. That's what we say to ourselves, and not just as a six-year-old, but as you know, a, a sixty-two-year-old. We we say these things, and they're not helpful. They're punitive, and they just stress us out more, right? So we need to suspend judgment. And the mm -hmm. third thing about mindfulness is you can't do it wrong. Mm -hmm. right? You'll sit there and yes, you'll be distracted. Oh, okay. I notice that. Bring my mind gently back and just get back to it, right? So mindfulness is really powerful as well. Right. And, and, then and, the I, last... think, and I think I think it was really interesting. You said like, yeah, you are going to have distractions. I think people get really, like you said, they, they're so hard on themselves. They're actually hard on themselves when they're doing mindfulness. They're like, I oh, suck yes. at this. When yeah, really, right. sometimes Which mindfulness is very judgmental. Little... <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's like the opposite. And um, yeah. No, that's, that's really interesting. And thank you for sharing those apps as well. Um, and I will definitely download those. Thank you. Um, and, you know, on the same thing, you know, just saying how you work so much with first responders, um, is there, so I'm not going into too much detail, but is there some specific patterns that you notice uh, that first responders, when you, when you're counseling them, that it's just a common theme that keeps coming up and what are those? Um, what are those themes? And as a spouse or family member, is there triggers or things we can look for in regards to that? I, I'll answer your last question first, uh, okay. partly because I remember it. Um, uh, <laughs> but, but no, it, it's, um, so things to look for are changes in functioning, right? Mm -hmm. if, if I see that my significant other is not as patient uh, with our kids, or if I see that uh, they're drinking more or turning to other substances, or if, if I see them just, uh, oh, here's a good one, playing video games 20 hours a, a day. It's not just kids who do that, right? You know, like, I mean, mm -hmm. if I see those changes in functioning, those are my concerns. If I see them not sleeping, not eating, or eating more than they would normally, or whatever it is, those kinds of changes in everyday function tell me an awful lot. If I find, you know, as a significant other, if in my relationship with this person, I find that our communication isn't the same, um, our, uh, our intimacy isn't the same, whatever it is, those kinds of changes, mm -hmm. if they, if they last, you know, I mean, we all have fluctuations and, 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 and everything else, but if they last, if they persist more than a little bit, then I'm worried. Mm -hmm. And then it's time to sort of have, you know, have that script for how you bring up I mean, I know I'm a husband, so I know that, you know, the most dreaded words you can hear are, you know, we need to talk. Um, <laughs> but just because but just because we dread hearing them doesn't mean they're not true, right? There are times where we all need to talk. Yeah, that's interesting. So and and I'm 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 wondering about the patterns part, like so that I for myself, I might notice the changes and the shifts of like, yeah, he's becoming a bit of a recluse or sleeping a lot longer than he usually would is, is really uh, quick to get angry to the kids, that kind of stuff. Um, and when when the first responder comes to you to talk about this, is it something you actually have to pull out of them? Or are they very are they aware of what's happening? I mean, they're coming to see you. So I'm assuming they might be. But I'm just curious. Um, yeah, usually they're, they're, yeah, they're there to see me because, you know, things, I, I do have a few people I see completely proactively. They're early mm -hmm. in their career and they say, no, I just want to check in with you every now and then to make sure everything's good, you know, and, okay. and so there are those, but most of the ones I see, you know, there's something that's happened where um, it's affected their, their own well-being or the well-being of those around them. It's affected their relationships or something, you know? And so, so yeah, typically there's something that, that, and sometimes it is a significant other saying, you know, I think you really could talk to someone like, like it's, I love you and, 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 you know, I'm there for you always, but, but, but you may need a, a little bit of professional help on this. Uh, one of the nice things about uh, talking to a mental health professional is unlike talking to your spouse, you don't need to protect that mental health professional. Right, mm -hmm. that it's not like, oh, I don't want to upset you. There's also professional um, uh, requirements around um, uh, confidentiality. And as long as there's no safety issues and things like that involved, you, mm -hmm. you know, I can tell this person this um, knowing full well that, that it's protected by pr uh, professional uh, privilege, right? And mm -hmm. so um, yeah. that can be reassuring as well. Um, and so the, like uh, the other thing is to just normalize the idea of talking to someone. You don't need a diagnosis. You don't need to be, uh, to, you know, stressed beyond belief before you go check in with someone. And, and, and you know, 
I know, I know with the way they've, they've restructured uh, OHIP, it's not quite the way it used to be where we would have routine physicals, but, but that was very much a part of, uh, you know, of mm -hmm. life for lots of us, was just going for our annual physical, right? Well, yeah. go for an annual mental as well. For sure. Especially, little. especially in the jobs that they're doing. I mean, you know, people who see this stress every week or day or month or whatever, you know, that's, I think that just should be almost a given, but that's my opinion. <laughs> um, no, and um, the only other thing I really wanted to touch on with that is um, you've you've mentioned before the uh, grit, gratitude, and growth, and that's sort of like the resiliency piece too. And can you just explain that a little bit more? What that is? I'd happily do that. Can I go before I do that though? I want to go back to something you'd asked before about those patterns. There's a couple oh, of other yeah, patterns sure. go ahead. I would mention about first responders. One is that they're people of action, right? Okay. And so they like a plan, they like a, a strategy, they want to have something. That's their, that's their job. They train. They right. train for worst case scenarios, and then they're they're effective when the rest of us. And you know that um, uh, um, that cliche uh, that you know the rest of society is running this way, while first responders get to run this way is absolutely true. Right. Right. But they are people of action, and when they're running this way. They're, they're doing so in a way that they're trained to do and, and, and you know, in a way that, that, that they can keep themselves safe as well. Um, but the other thing, the other pattern I notice, and it's one of the things I said, you know, 80% of the people I see are first responders, 20% are healthcare professionals. One of the things that the groups have in common mm -hmm. is we both suck at putting ourselves first, right? We are mm -hmm. way more comfortable dealing with everyone else's crap, but when it comes to ours, it's like, oh, no, I'm good. You know, like just, and, and so that would be another pattern um, uh, that I mm -hmm. see as well. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it's um, and it and and in many respects it can be one of the things that attracts a spouse uh, to someone like that too is how giving they are and how they really are, are very good at putting other yes. people uh, uh, putting other people's needs first you mm -hmm. know yeah. but it it becomes a liability when we're hurting you know when we talk about PTSD I tell people you know PTSD isn't what's wrong with you it's what happened to you right right and so so getting them to practice some self compassion some of that kindness and compassion they show those people that they work with sometimes under very difficult circumstances saving some of that for themselves as well mm -hmm. right? yeah so no, i love get, that yeah getting and back to the great gratitude oh yeah. sorry, did you want me to, oh okay great gratitude and growth. <laughs> sure. so, Go so, for it. you know I like routine, ritual, and ridiculous, and grit, gratitude, and growth. They're easy. For that's my why brain. I love this. I want these yeah. to be like the thing. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's it, they're easy for my old brain to remember, right? And so the grit piece is, it, and, and this comes from the work of a psychologist down in the states, Angela Duckworth, who did this work, really cool work. She looked at very different groups of people um, that are under very stressful conditions to see what helped them succeed, and. Um, and and she uh, she found that and oh the group she looked at were kids who do the script spelling bee, um, uh, U.S. Military Academy uh, cadets and so like at uh, West Point, um, uh, inner city school teachers who are starting out their career and commission salespeople very different but very stressful uh, uh, endeavors mm -hmm. and she found that the, the that what led to their success. It wasn't intelligence, it wasn't good looks, it wasn't any of those things, it was grit, their ability to hang in there when things get tough. Mm. And I have to tell you that, that, and this is the really cool part and the really good news about working with first responders, you would be very hard pressed to find a grittier bunch of people. They work hard at stuff, they love their training, they, put the, they pour themselves into it, um, mm -hmm. and, um, and they don't, and like, you know, that resilience piece as well, right? They hang in there when things get tough. Right. And the, the, the thing that makes it especially cool is that one of the ways that you can teach grit is to hang out with other gritty people. Well, that's where first responders are so fortunate because they're surrounded in many cases by gritty people, right? Mm -hmm. Other things you can do is, if, again, first responders are good at this. Pursue what you love. A lot right. of first responders that I, I see, uh, even when they've experienced significant occupational stress injury, still love what they do and want yeah. to get back on the road, you know? And mm -hmm. so they're, they're, that's the grit piece. Mm -hmm. The gratitude piece, um, uh, the, in fact, the studies around gratitude now show that if you just practice gratitude, you can buy gratitude books that you write in, you can have, you can program gratitude into your phone where it prompts you. And what they find is if you do it three or four times a week, it mm -hmm. can be really helpful. Mm -hmm. And, it, and, and it, they used to think, well, maybe it's just people who have a lot to be grateful for. 
that if they practice gratitude, they feel better. But in, so then they did studies of people who had been diagnosed with depression and with anxiety disorders and had them practice gratitude and found that they felt better as well. Mm. You don't feel all better. It would be lovely if people felt all better, but they feel somewhat better doing that, right? right? And so practicing yeah. a little bit of gratitude and that can be learned, acquired as a skill as well. Yeah. And the third one, the growth piece, we get so fixated on post-traumatic stress disorder and for good reason. I mean, I'm not trying to minimize it at all. Uh, remarkably, I think I was mentioning earlier, remarkably, most first responders do not develop post-traumatic stress disorder, even though every single one of them is exposed to traumatic circumstances, right? And the mm -hmm. ones who do, it's not a weakness that they developed it. It's just, yeah, whatever resilience they have, their other, their other skills, everything else, at some point it's cumulative, it gets overwhelmed. Mm -hmm. But we forget the other side of things. And that is that there's also something called post-traumatic growth. Now, this is different than resilience. Resilience is bouncing back. It happens quickly, almost, uh, almost automatically, not quite, but almost automatically. Mm -hmm. right? Post-traumatic growth happens over time. It's a much more painful process. It comes out of the pain of some of the trauma that you've experienced and everything else. But you get a different appreciation for life. The way you treat relationships, the, the way you treat those closest to you, the way you value those things, the, the desire, in many cases, the desire to give back. Um, sometimes for people, it can be a spiritual thing as well, you know, mm -hmm. and, and, and so there is this opportunity for growth as well. The, the remarkable thing about first responders is, you know, that, that yes, uh, they, they can sometimes end up where their, their, uh, their nervous system is on high alert almost all the time because of their stressful experience. But the other thing happens sometimes as well, where the rest of us are freaking out because, oh, there, there's a shortage of toilet paper or something <laughs> like that. It's a real crisis. You know, and, 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 and some of this I get from my, my disaster response. Pe people would say, well, we have a crisis. And in my brain, I wasn't stupid enough, I'd say it out loud, but in my brain, I'm thinking, okay, well, what's the body count? Because if there's not a body count, there probably isn't a crisis. Right. And so you can find that many first responders and their families, because you guys go through this stuff with them, mm -hmm. um, can be very calm in certain circumstances where everybody else is, is lo losing their proverbial poop. Yeah, I actually I totally agree. I remember this whole toilet paper thing. I had no idea why people were, I thought maybe coronavirus meant you pooped a lot or something. <laughs> I was just so confused. It was, wasn't it? Just, yeah. I was just like, huh? Everyone's yeah. running around and I'm just, meh. Yeah. Um, yeah, so interesting. So, I, you know, I, we've kind of touched a lot of stuff. Is there anything else you would like to add just for as a spouse or a family member that, um and, and as a first responder that you would like to, us to know. Thank you, is what I'd like you to know. Oh, well, that's really sweet. <laughs> uh, no, I, um, I'm a big suck. Aww. And I love, what, I love what you folks do. I love what your spouses do. Um, it, and it is a team, you know, and I know how, an, how uh, and the people I talk to, how essential it is that they, and how difficult it is when they don't have that significant other. I have to be very careful because some people go home, you know, yeah. and, and not to minimize cats, but, you know, they go home to a cat and, and that's it sometimes, right? And maybe not even that. Um, and so the, the importance of what you folks do, I know that, that, that when spouses, and this is true, men or women who are married to first responders or partners with, with first responders, um, when they send their loved ones off to work, you know, there's a heightened anxiety um, that, you, you, you know, that you probably don't have. These days with COVID, I think lots of people going off to work, they're, they're, they're significant others, and they themselves, of course, feel that anxiety too. But with first responders, some, there's something different. And so uh, I really appreciate what you guys do in sharing your significant others with our community. Um, we forget, um, we never get to see the fruits of our preventions, you know, like, like, so if, 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 um, if you're teaching, uh, you know, so, so you, you're a paramedic, you know about the values of naloxone and you've got somebody, you've trained someone who knows how to use naloxone, who's not a first responder, who's not a paramedic. And it's like, but you don't see the people walking around whose lives were saved because of that. When you're a firefighter, you know, and you've done, you, you, you've drilled it into people that, yeah, put, change your batteries and your smoke detectors and things like that. And someone wakes up and yep, there's a fire or smoke or whatever, and they get their kids out safely and everything else. They, 
that they don't see those people walking around living long and happy lives, you know? And and when you're a police officer driving down Bank Street and you don't see, you know, buildings on fire and, and stores being looted, you know, you don't remember that that's because of the work that you do. So that's, that's my last uh, parting kind of word would be thank you. Thank you to the first responders and thank you to their families uh, and loved ones. Thank you. Morning. Thank you, Dr. Phil. You are doing an amazing job. I'm really, um, I'm blessed to have you and giving it us uh, your insight, but also I, I very much appreciate your kind words because it is difficult, as you know, out there for first responders right now, specifically also police have it much more difficult. Um, and it's nice to hear, hear that from you. So thank you very much. Thanks. Oh, my pleasure. And thanks for what you guys are doing here, putting this together. <laughs> no problem. Oh, no, you're you're muted, can't Amber. Hear Amber, ha ha. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> an Amber issue. <laughs> no, I just want to say thank you as as well as a first responder spouse. Um, hearing this and kind of giving some more insight to our first responder family on on what this is all about, and um, I really appreciate the the grit part of it because Sarah and I are trying really hard to create a community of spouses on all three services to make sure that we are, you know, we're a community uh, and build the resiliency and find a community that we can um, stick with that raises us all up as opposed mm -hmm. to the negativity of what's out there bringing us all down. So yeah. right. this is, this is huge for us and we appreciate this. I can go on and on. We can all go on and on and we would love to have, <laughs> I have so many more questions. I would love to, oh, have to do it again. <laughs> I'm happy. You know what? I'm happy to. I love the sound of my own voice. You can tell. Um, <laughs> but, but no, I'm, I, I, anything I can do to support you guys. The one thing I can't do is take on more clients at this point in time. So don't flash my private practice <laughs> number and no, no. call him 24 no. hours a day. No, um, but, we, we but no, anything I can do this to... insight, this insight is great. Um, you know, when I say we could ask more questions, it's more about like the family and family resiliency and like bringing up the kids, you, you have the background behind kids and, and, you know, a lot of us in our, on our spouse group, um, have kids, have young kids and dealing with all of what comes with a first responder family is, is a huge part of, of what we're seeing in a theme across all of us and how do, how do we manage, especially mm -hmm. those right now with, with police officers in the family, um, in dealing and COVID with the and all, yeah. of all of that. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I'm happy, uh, I'm happy to talk about that another time where, where, mm -hmm. um, I I've done a lot of parenting presentations and things like that as well. So, awesome. so uh, if at some point you wanted to, to do that as well, I'm happy to, to do that too. Well, Thank you again. I appreciate that. Thank you, Sarah, um, for uh, leading the questions. And uh, this was a pleasure having this conversation. So um, thank you everyone for watching and have a great evening. Thanks. Thanks. Take care all.